Hello. Thank you so much for joining me today. Today, I'll briefly be talking about my most recent book, ISIS, Ideology, Symbolics, and Counter-Narratives, which was published in 2019 by Rutledge Press in one of their series on advances in sociology. So just briefly, uh, why did I write this book? I mean, isn't that the question that most people ask of themselves? So in about in 2018, I was constantly thinking about what was happening in Syria and Iraq and about the rise of ISIS. And that is when I thought, OK, I don't know much about this topic. I don't know much about ISIS. So why don't I learn some more and then write a book about it? And in my view, writing a book about anything is the best form of learning about a topic. So that was my primary reason, not deeply personal. I also wanted to study it and share my ideas with the readers in the world. But I also wanted to give a nuanced account of ISIS and hence the book. Now, the title already suggests that what I, uh, you know, it's not an, uh, a sociological account, nor is it strictly a hard historical or cultural research into ISIS. My methodology attempted to answer a few questions. Like how does someone like an ISIS member emerge? How is that identity created? Which ideology does he or she exist in? What kind of ideologies are mobilized to create these human beings? And then how can we understand their actions better? And so what I decided to do was I conflated three conceptual concepts in one chapter, not conflated, but discuss them first, ideology itself which of course comes from Marx, but I was mostly relying on Louis Althusser. Uh, then uh, the framing by George Lakoff and Johnson, one of their books is about framing. And then the third theorist that I was using was of course Foucault and theory of discourse. So my point was to understand, first of all, in what kind of ideology does one have to exist in order to receive a hail, an invitation from those running ISIS or ISIS as an organization. Because I refuse to believe that every Muslim so-called is you know, a terrorist in waiting. I mean, that's a stereotype that most people use on the right, but I completely disagree with it. So in my reading then, what I was studying also was not just the ISIS history, its rise, but how does ISIS promote itself? How does it appeal to its future adherents or followers? And that took me online. Of course, there was so much material that they were publishing. There was certain specific historic vocabularies that they were using to entice a certain specific segment of the Muslim world. And in my reading, and you can find more details in the book, the person most suited to a hail or uh, an invitation by ISIS would then be someone who is highly influenced by the Wahhabi branch of Islam coming from Saudi Arabia. Maybe not all of them, but that to me was very obvious was the proverbial slippery slope because there is an emphasis in that brand of Islam on a certain degree of puritanism, a certain degree of absolute faith in oneness of God and not giving any social or other cultural aspects of spirituality to um, impact your way of feeling the faith or living in it. So that was my first uh, obvious not obvious, but uh, first conclusion out of this research. And the second to me was that uh, ISIS doesn't, uh, you know, come to be in isolation. ISIS and Taliban and others, which have already previously argued, are a product of neoliberal capital. And it's the failure of the post-colonial nation states in their redemptive functions, which may not be 
causing the rise, but which creates the ideal conditions for organizations like ISIS and Al Qaeda to incorporate these people into their own system. And it's not a very far fetched idea. I mean, the same is happening in the United States. How is it that the extreme right can recruit more and more young people because these young people are existing in neoliberal capital and mostly feel that they have been left out of it? The argument is the same. And I had argued this in one of my previous books, right? Uh, Talibanization of America. So that was roughly what I kind of went with. And then I also mostly focused on the ISIS produced texts, right? citations from their al -Dabik. That's the journal that they used to publish. al Rumia was another journal. And mostly what I learned, which so many other people had already claimed also was that this, there is a combination of end time narratives with the historically retrieved narrative of the Khilafat. And within that, a space, the Syrian soil becomes the promised space where the last conflict will be fought, right? And all of these are combined to recruit people so that they come and join the so-called last battle. And in the process of doing that, then the ISIS leadership also creates its own others who can be anyone, but especially Muslims who don't believe in their mission. These were some of my findings. And uh, as far as the organization of the book, you know, there are uh, five chapters. I mean, introduction and conclusion excluded. There are five chapters. The first chapter gives a historical overview. Uh, the second chapter explains the ideology and narrative structure and the discourse which mobilizes ISIS. Uh, the third ch chapter is uh, on how ISIS recruits its mujahids and it also gives a detailed account of the mujahid subjectivity itself. How is it created? How is jihad viewed? by these jihadist organizations. The fourth chapter is entitled The Management of Savagery, uh, which is a critical reading of probably one of the most crucial documents in, in uh, the jihadist circles. And it's available in translation. It's called The Management of Savagery, and you can read it online. And I just go and read not just what's in it, but also how does the author argue for the kind of things that he's suggesting in his book. And by management of savagery, uh, the author doesn't mean that people should become savage. What he's talking about is a phase, an intragnum, when the existing system has been destroyed and has not been replaced by a so-called Islamic system, how to manage that phase, that barbaric phase. Because what he says is that it's during that phase that the Islamists can actually create loyalties to their cause. And he goes to uh, the example of Afghanistan where Taliban were able to mobilize that savage phase to their own advantage. And then I have a the, the chapter five deals with the neoliberal capital. How does it become a spawning um, environment for such kind of not just ISIS, but other right wing organizations? And uh, then how to tackle this? Uh, I mean, there are no great solutions that I provide. I'm a humanist, so my solutions are connected to education, but I try to do that in this last chapter. And then I conclude, my conclusions are usually hopeful, right? And overall, to sum up, this is a really brief book. It's not very complex. It explains its own theory, and it tries to address a few questions. What is ISIS? How does it rise? How does one become a member of ISIS? What recruitment tools do they use? What specific brand of Islam is mobilized um, to build the narrative of ISIS? And what is the role of United States, other world powers, and the neoliberal capital itself in the process of this subject creation and the cre creation of these terroristic and other organizations? So I hope this is helpful. 
Um, uh, I hope you read the book. And if you have any questions about the book, or if you would like me to add some more to this video or in another video, please feel free to leave me comments. In, and I'll put the details about the books in the description. And I hope you get to read it. And if you read it, please share your views with me. Thank you so much for joining me. And I will see you uh, probably in one of my other vid videos. Goodbye.